My name is Todd Richardson, and I am an art history professor. Uh, I have slowly come to admit that I'm also somewhat of a real estate developer. <laughs> My hope is that for, at the end of this talk, that combination won't seem so unusual. For the past five and a half years, I have been helping to redevelop this massive 1.5 million square foot historic building, the Sears Roebuck Distribution Center and Retail Store. Constructed in 1927, it's been empty for the last 22 years. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're trying to do to change that. But I first want to tell you the story of how we got here in the first place. When we started in spring of 2010, it definitely was not your typical real estate development project. First off, you had an artist, an academic, that's me, and a businessman, the building's owner, who were trying to find it a new life. Second, instead of starting with a predetermined vision that we were working towards, our process was one of discovery. And there were plenty of dilemmas uh, to go along the way. So what I want to do to start us out is to share with you a couple of lessons that we've learned over the course of the last five years that I think define most consistently our process. First, creativity rarely happens in a silo. Thank goodness the myth of the solitary genius as the only source of innovation has started to crumble. Second, innovation often starts with renovation. Said another way, answers to big questions often come from looking within ourselves rather than outside ourselves. To illustrate what I mean, I think it's important we start actually at the very beginning. <laughs> nope, I didn't get my slides mixed up with last week's Italian Renaissance class. Seriously, though, the, 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 the story of how the Crosstown Project has taken shape actually does begin here. Over 700 years ago in 13th century Italy, where we have found inspiration in a not-so-different story about an even more iconic building, the Florence Cathedral. When construction started in 1296, civic pride was at its peak. The building was designed to be one of the largest in Europe. It was designed to hold the city's entire population. But the problem is, it didn't start out looking like this. It looked like this. By 1370, the main body of the church had been constructed, but it didn't have a top. No one could figure out how to design a dome that would span the 150 feet across for 50 years, 50 years, rain just poured right into what was supposed to be the architectural crown jewel of Florence. A massive building in the city center that was supposed to offer a beacon of hope instead served as a disappointing reminder of unmet expectations. Well, finally in 1418, a group of city leaders decided that they would open up their dilemma to a broader audience. They stood in front of the Florence Cathedral, and they uh, announced an open competition for anyone to come and design the dome. And if legends are true, it was an artist, academic, and businessman <laughs> that helped to discover the solution. Sound familiar? Yes, it does. Cosimo de' Medici, an ambitious local banker who had actually encouraged the competition, helped his good friend Filippo Brunelleschi get the job. And by the way, Brunelleschi had no formal training in architecture. What's interesting about Brunelleschi, though, is he was a part of an active academic circle that had embraced a renewed enthusiasm for the classical humanities. They met regularly and they talked about a wide range of things because the humanities of the Renaissance didn't just include the stuff of music and poetry. It included math and geometry and astronomy. As a result, the thought process that Brunelleschi brought to the problem of the dome was one informed by multiple ways of thinking. 
In fact, two of his friends at the time were Paolo Toscanelli, who was a math scholar at the University of Padua, and um, Nicholas of Cusa, who was a doctor theologian. Brunelleschi not only solved the riddle of the dome, but his design for how to distribute weight over large expanses actually changed architecture forever and helped to define the spirit of the Renaissance. The point is, though, that he didn't do it alone. It took a trusting patron and the collective insights from a diverse group of people to solve a centuries-old problem. Creativity rarely happens in a silo. Although it had a top to its tower, uh, the Sears Crosstown building served a, a, a similar challenge, what to do with so much space that had been empty for so long. To answer that question, let's look back at the building's history. Finished in 1927, Memphians embraced it. On opening day, 35,000 people toured the site. It would grow to employ 1,500 people, and it would process up to 45,000 packages daily. It was truly Amazon before Amazon, and the city loved it. The building came to help define the city's identity. If Memphis is now America's distribution hub, the Sears Crosstown building played a significant role in helping to earn that title. But spring of 2010 was a different time. Sears was long gone, and the building was an eyesore. A massive building in the city center that was supposed to offer a beacon of hope instead served as a disappointing reminder of unmet expectations. This is where Crosstown Arts comes in, uh, a nonprofit founded in 2010 to help start the, to start the conversation about what to do with the building. The group was made up of a diverse group of, uh, of disciplines, including the art and academic and businessmen I told you about before. We added an architect, a designer, an engineer. We even had our own doctor theologian in the mix who you heard from just before lunch. But as you can see from this picture, we opened up our dilemma to a much broader audience. We even designed a series of competitions, not to design the building, but to help improve the neighborhood. This is actually a photograph from Memfeast, an annual dinner where artists present public art projects that they'd like to make in Crosstown. Afterwards, everyone votes, and whoever gets the most votes gets $5,000 to make their work. Not only are, are Memphians engaged in the creative process, the neighborhood is beautified, and most importantly, people began to look at the building and see what could be rather than what was already there. Memphis is just one example of hundreds of events that have happened in Crosstown that have brought thousands of people there. And the arts was not only a catalyst for community building, I believe that it was actually that collective approach that led to the solution for what to do with so much empty space. But before I go into detail about that, I gotta tell you another Renaissance story that helps to define or describe or illustrate that second lesson of innovation often starts with renovation. When construction on the Florence Cathedral was underway, painting in Europe looked something like this. Flat, with little depth, formulaic, that is, no perspective. Enter Brunelleschi, the artist who solved the riddle of the dome, and his mathematician friend, Toscanelli. Together, they devised an experiment that would discover the foundations for what we call today linear perspective. And that is, the systematic representation of three dimensions on a flat surface. And the discovery would literally change the way people viewed the world. Within a relatively short period of time, painting went from looking something like this to something like this. That is, an illusion of reality as if looking through a window. Although the discovery of linear perspective is arguably one of the most important moments in history, what's even more interesting is why they felt the need to paint realistically in the first place. Why weren't they content with this? This style had defined art in Europe for over 700 years. 700 years. 
Why change now? In short, they were tired of following the traditions of other cultures and wanted to embrace those things that were uniquely their own. Until the 14th century, Italian art had been dominated by Byzantine style. That is a style from another place. But as I mentioned with Brunelleschi and his friends, people increasingly became fascinated with the art and literature from their own region's ancient past. For example, this sculpture of a Trojan prophet, this ancient sculpture of a, a Trojan prophet, was discovered by a farmer plowing his field outside of Rome in 1506. Of course, it's a, it's a completely different manner of expression. And Italians loved the physical and the emotional realism, especially as compared to Byzantine abstraction. More and more, the ideas that defined their cultural past were elevated as models to imitate in the present. Not because they were old, but because they were uniquely theirs. In fact, the artist Michelangelo was one of the first to the scene when the sculpture was uncovered, and you can see from this slide on the left how much it impacted his work. The discovery of linear perspective didn't happen in a vacuum. It was a response to a desire from artists to paint more realistically. Why? Because they rediscovered what their cultural past looked like, and they embraced it. They weren't trying to do something new. They wanted to break away from traditions inherited from somewhere else and embrace all things local. Nice, nice transition, huh? <laughs> Today, Memphis is starting to experience its own kind of renaissance. Granted, we may not dig up ancient sculptures in a farmer's backyard, but we do have our own versions of prophets that are being reclaimed for new purpose, or as Al Green might say, born again. <clears throat> Since we're using the term renaissance, let's agree on what it means. The word means rebirth, or renew. Notice I did not say birth or new. There are plenty of places in the world that are growing, but growth doesn't necessarily equal renaissance. In fact, renaissance has little to do with growth or innovation. We talk about a lot about innovation these days, but the renaissance is actually more about renovation recognizing the unique value of what was already there and reclaiming it for new purpose. I hope some of this is sounding familiar to you. In Memphis, small businesses are starting up, old buildings are finding new life, and most importantly, people care. Civic pride is palpable. Think global, eat local, locavore, Farm to Table, Grit, Grind, I Love Memphis, Choose 901, Memphis Music Town, Rails to Trails, and last but not least, Memphis as? Ha 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 ha. Fun. <laughs> no! <laughs> this is the stuff of the Renaissance a renewed enthusiasm for our unique local identity inspires civic pride, which then attracts economic investment, the result of which is growth and rebirth. Now back to that development vision for what to do with so much empty space. Rather than take a typical anchor tenant approach, where we try to recruit some huge tenant from anywhere in the country and then fill in around the edges. What we decided to do was look at the building as an opportunity to create a whole new neighborhood within it. But it wasn't just about tenants co-locating. The idea was to put together the components of a healthy neighborhood, residential, quality education and health care, arts and entertainment, and of course, 
good food, and then stack them vertically in the 10 floors that are the Sears building. A vertical urban village, we began to call it, where organizations are actually better because they want to be together, to share space, to share resources, even to share staff. And this is the message that we evangelized for two years. And what happened next is another great example of a Memphis renaissance. People began to embrace the vision. And Vertical Village took shape through organizations that are local organizations, that are some of the most well-known and well-respected organizations in Memphis who are also major players in the three areas that have and I believe will continue to define the future of our city, and that is arts, education, and healthcare. More organizations have joined the Vertical Village. In fact, we've leased 560,000 of the 620,000 square feet of commercial space available. There'll also be restaurant and retail and 270 apartments. People will be living and working, healing and growing, teaching and learning, shopping and eating like a really great neighborhood. But finally, the point is that we didn't do it alone. Real estate professionals didn't go into a room and devise a vision to simply implement. It was discovered. And similar to the Florence Cathedral Dome, it took a trusting patron and the collective insights of a diverse group of people to creatively solve a decades-old problem. A vertical village anchored in arts, education, and health care is definitely something that's new. But we can't forget that this is where we started. The result may be innovation, but it started with a renovation made possible by Memphians who share a renewed enthusiasm for our city and our unique character. As we continue to think about what's next for Memphis, what if we took the lessons of the Renaissance and Crosstown as models to follow? To define a vision for our future, not by comparing ourselves to other cities, but by looking within and embracing all those things that are uniquely us. And that, my friends, is an idea worth spreading to everybody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>